Hello, I am Glenn Hall. Today is March 24th, 2023. This video is called Blotted from the Book of Life. It is part two of my commentary on Christ's letter to the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter three. The first video uh, concerning Sardis was called Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I read from Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus confronts the Pharisees who say that he cast out a demon by the spirit of Satan. Jesus ended this little part by saying in verse 32, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. That's talking about himself. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Later in... Um, Well, in Revelation chapter 3, as Jesus talks about the overcomers in that church, he says there's only a few who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Well, that clearly indicates that there are going to be some whose names are blotted out of the book of life. In fact, evidently, most of the people in the church of Sardis are going to be blotted out of the book of life. For them, this scripture, I believe, has proven true that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees saying, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, church doctrine interprets this as being never forgiven, ever. And that's because the church does not understand that God works in successive ages of time. We are now at the end of the church age. And the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ is at hand. And then we are going to go into the millennial age. So Jesus is saying that anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit in this age will not be forgiven in this age. He can't be forgiven because he can't discern evil from good or good from evil. He doesn't know. For some reason, he doesn't know what is of, of the Spirit of God and he doesn't versus what is of the Spirit of Satan. He can't discern that. And for that reason, he will not partake in the first resurrection that occurs at the very beginning of the millennium. He has to wait until the second resurrection that occurs at the end of the millennium. And we'll look at some of those verses in, in a little while. They're in uh, chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And so, at that time, the book of Revelation, chapter 20, says that they will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, church, again, church doctrine states that that's eternal punishment in fire. It's not. It's not being cast into literal fire. It is being put into a situation where you become subject to those who are holy, who have already, who already are in the presence of the consuming fire, who already live in the presence of the eternal God. 
they themselves have become fire. They themselves now have the character of God. And that's what it means to be a son of God. And that's what Jesus meant, that he gave power. Those who believed in him were given power to become sons of God. The problem is, and the problem with church doctrine is that they do not understand this and they do not know that there are distinctions between Christians, people who believe, or at least say they believe in Jesus, and others. They believe that all Christians are going to go immediately to heaven. They, most of them believe that there's going to be a rapture bef before this horrible tribulation coming upon the earth. And that everybody, every Christian is going to be part of that. And it's false doctrine. It's just, that is not what the scripture teaches. So today we're going to look at the doctrines concerning having your name blotted from the book of life and the second death and the lake of fire. The book of life is mentioned in Exodus chapter 32. That's the chapter where Moses had been on the mountain for 40 days and the people think he's gone forever. Aaron then makes a golden calf and the people worship the golden calf and fall into sin. And then in chapter 30 of Exodus 32, it says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to I am. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses was a priest. He was a higher priest than Aaron was. Because Aaron became the high priest of Israel. So Moses returned to I am and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But I am said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. His angel, the angel of the Lord, Jesus. And the New Testament says that Jesus was with them in the wilderness. Now, let's look at a few things Jesus said to his disciples in uh, Matthew 16, he says this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. That word life there is the word suke in Greek, which means soul. So it speaks of the mind, the will, the emotions. Whoever would save his soul will lose it. But whoever loses his life, and again, that's the word suke or soul, whoever loses his life, his soul for my sake will find it. And what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Then Jesus told a parable in Matthew 22. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. This is verse 1, Matthew 22, 1. Spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. 
and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Okay, now that's talking about the Jews. The Jews would not come, and they didn't come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Okay, now that's been happening all through the time of the Jews, before Jesus was crucified, and then for the the next 40 years that they existed before Rome destroyed them. And then it's also been true through the church age that his servants have been killed and treated shamefully. Verse 7, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities, their city. So that's speaking of Jerusalem. Then he said to the servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. The Jews were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. So that's been happening now for 2,000 years. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. This word chosen also occurs, you see it as the word elect. And in Matthew 24, when Jesus talks about the great signs that false prophets will do, he said that they could deceive even the elect or the chosen if that were possible. The elect, the chosen, are going to make it. But what about the others? What about those who were called but not chosen? What about those who were called but don't have a wedding garment on? Who are they? Well, those are the people in Revelation 3 that have soiled their garments. And those who are not awake and those who are not ready for the Lord. Jesus warns them in verse 3, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. In other words, go back to the scriptures. Go back to the word of God. And obey the word. The obedience of faith. When we have faith, we will obey. Then he says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Jesus is coming at a thief. It's amazing to me that so many people, Christians, Christian leaders, do not see that we have entered tribulation. We are at the end time. They still are expecting some great revival, some great glory, great glory clouds, and they think they're the head of it, many of them. These are the people who have soiled their garments. The next verse, verse 4, says, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. How do we get that garment? The garment 
is by total trust in Christ. Totally trusting in Christ and not our own works of the flesh. Yes, we will do works when we trust in Christ. And when we follow his spirit, we will do works of the spirit and we will have good fruit. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told them to lose their souls for his sake. In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is all about the salvation of the soul. And I'm going to read now the uh, last part of chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's talking about washing yourself with the word there. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That word meet together, is those two words come from the Greek word episinugogi, which speaks of the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And it only occurs in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, besides right here in Hebrews 10, with respect to the second coming of Jesus. That's how it starts. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the word episinugogi, the coming. So not neglecting the doctrine of the coming of Jesus Christ, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I see the day drawing near. I've been seeing it now for 26 years, and I've been telling people this for 26 years. Then Verse 26, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, Christ's Christ's death for you is not effective if you go on deliberately sinning. That's what that's saying. You don't have grace to sin once you are saved. And that is one of the greatest heresies of the church. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So people... Say, Christ did away with the law. The law, we're not under the law, we're under grace. True. However, you don't have license to sin. The law teaches us what sin is. And by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can put away sin and stop living after sin. 
The writer of Hebrews says, if you set aside the law of Moses, you die without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment is it going to be for those who have lived in sin, who have trampled underfoot the Son of God, because they thought they had grace to sin? Verse 32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, after you were awakened, after you saw the truth that is in Jesus, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls win their souls. They win their souls by losing their souls. This is their second death. We're going to read now in the book of Revelation how people will have a part in the second death. But you can you can actually take part in the second death now by losing your soul for Christ's sake. That's what the doctrine of soul salvation is all about, is giving your life now for the Lord rather than living your life for yourself. That's the problem that, is, that has happened with most Christians who will end up being blotted from the book of life. They decided to live their lives for gain. They're the seed that got caught up in the thorns. All of the uh, cares of life and getting rich and all of the things that the world has to offer. The whole book of Hebrews is written in order to prepare us, the overcomers, to be able to make it through this journey. It's exactly what Revelation chapter 12 speaks of. Twelve eleven says this. 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his, of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have overcome him. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Unto the death of their soul, of their own aspirations in this life to be somebody great, to the death, even their physical death, if that became necessary. Now remember, Sardis told us that there were going to be people in that church, in fact most of them, whose names would be blotted out of the book of life. I want to read to you another scripture that deals with that. It's in Revelation chapter 13. And this is concerning uh, the beast that rises out of the sea. 
verse 7. It was allowed to make war on the Kodeshim. In the Bible, it's said saints, but I use the word Kodeshim because it means holy one. The saints are the holy ones. Also, it was allowed to make war on the Kodeshim and to conquer them. An authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. The beast that rises from the sea. All who dwell on earth. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. The book of life and their names. These are the names of the chosen. Their names were written before the foundation of the world. I don't believe that their names can be blotted out of the book of life. But obviously there are some people who have become Christians whose names can be blotted out. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to start. First, Satan is bound for a thousand years. And then verse 4 says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. That means the ones who came to life and ruled with Christ for a thousand years. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, in the first resurrection, the overcomers are resurrected. They're glorified to be like Christ The second death has no power over them. And the reason why the second death has no power over them is because they willingly died to the things of this world during their lives. So they lost their souls for Christ's sake. Now the reality is Christ died for all men. He died for the spirits of every single person on earth. But each comes into a relationship with God in a particular order. These who are the first part of the first resurrection are those whom the Bible calls the first fruits or the firstborn. Jesus is called the first fruit, the first fruits of creation. But so are the sons who are birthed in the first resurrection. I believe there's even one resurrection that occurs before this, and that's the man-child who you see in Revelation chapter 12. At the beginning of 12, Revelation 12, you have this, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth, pains, and the agony of giving birth. 
And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. I believe that that speaks of the tribulation, the 1260 days, and I believe that the, this male child, this man child, is the first fruits of creation like Christ was. And that there's going to be a glorification of what the Bible calls the 144,000. And those people are going to be going to comprise the man-child. And they will prepare and keep safe that part of the body that will participate in the first resurrection. She's not ready yet. But there's going to be a large group that becomes ready. And I believe that that group, there's two parts of that group. One is the Bride of Christ, and the second are the guests who are invited to the wedding feast. The man-child will be what's called the body of Christ or the friends of the bridegroom, those who are with the bridegroom. I believe that there are, they are the ones who would be what the Bible says in Jesus' parable, that they produced a hundredfold. The bride would be those who produce sixtyfold. And then the guests would be those who produce thirtyfold, according to the parable of the seeds. But each one of them are one of the seeds that prevailed and produced fruit in this realm in this life because they took part of the second death during this lifetime. Those who are part of the first resurrection have no part in the second death because they have already gone through the second death. There are three deaths in Scripture. You have the death of the Spirit that occurred to all men because Adam sinned. So we all are born spiritually dead. Our spirits are quickened when we come to faith in Christ. But Christ died for the spirits of all men. And all will come to, to faith. And all will bow down. Numerous scriptures talk about that. Let me continue with um, Revelation 20 at this point. At the end of Revelation 20, verse 11, you have this. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire.
Before that, in verse 10, you have Satan being thrown into the, and the false prophet. Well, the false prophet and the beast were thrown in in Revelation 19. But Satan is finally thrown in in Revelation 20.10. And then here, in, at the end of the book of Revelation, verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And in verse 14, it says this, this is the second death, the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is the second death. The lake of fire is the application of God's rule to a person's life. When someone begins to really walk in God's, God's way, that's when they come to the end of their souls, the end of their uh, lustful natures, and it's also the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. People who come, who are resurrected at this second resurrection, a lot of them are going to be surprised because they would have thought that they would have made the first cut, the first resurrection, and they didn't. So it looks like there will be some people whose names are found in the Book of Life. I think those people are going to be those who were saved during the millennium. Because I think the people who, whose names are written in the book of life, whose names have not been blotted out, are going to partake of the first resurrection. You won't partake of the first resurrection if your name has been blotted out of the book of life. And it's not gonna be there either at the second resurrection. If your name was blotted out, you have not had a chance yet for your name to be added back in. So the reality of Christianity is quite different than what most of us were taught, isn't it? Who's heard, who, who has heard that a Christian has the possibility of losing his salvation. Now there's a particular book that I really recommend that you get. It's called The Second Death and the Restitution of All Things written by Andrew John Jukes. You might be able to still find this on Amazon. That's where I got this particular copy. And uh, I think this is the best one I've been able to find. I did get another copy later uh, after I bought this. But it seems to be lacking a few things that are in this one, maybe some footnotes or things like that. There was some things I wanted to read to finish this up today. This is on page 38 of this. Christ barely entered on his priestly work till he had passed through death and judgment. So with those who are Christ, their death and resurrection shall only introduce them to fuller and wider service to lost ones, over whom the Lord shall set them as his priests and kings, until all things are restored and reconciled unto him. It is also true that some of the church's sons, some like Esau, shall sell their birthright for some present good thing, and that in this age, as in the last, some of the children of the kingdom shall be cast out while others from the east and from the west press in and win the crown and the kingdom. Yet an elect firstborn shall surely be preserved, who are sealed to this preeminence to be priests to God and rulers of their brethren. To whom, I ask, shall the church after death be priests? Shall it be to that great mass of our fellow men who have departed hence in ignorance? Shall it be to spirits in prison? 
such as those to whom after his death Christ himself once preached. He's referring to uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 20. And uh, I want to read that. Let's look at that. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, <coughs> who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This baptism he's speaking about is the washing of water of the word, which, and he says it now saves you. He's not talking about your spirit, your initial salvation. He's talking about your soul salvation. So he's talking about washing yourself with the water of the word so that you can come and be part of the first resurrection. But this clearly says that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, see, most people would say all those people from before the flood, their spirits were lost, that they were not saved. Clearly, that's not true, is it? Shall not Christ's saints, Christ's Kodeshim, made like him do the same works, in other words, preach to the spirits in prison, still following him and with him being priests to God, will not their glory be to rule and feed and enlighten and clothe those who are committed to them, even as Christ has fed and clothed them? For he is King of kings and Lord of lords, words which indicate that many kings and rulers under him, of whom he, he is head, and whom he makes heads to others. I should perhaps be going beyond my measure were I to follow in detail all that the law says further as to the first fruits and the firstborn. He, see, he understands that all of Scripture is parabolic and teaches prophetic truth. But I may add here that this same truth that the first blessed must save others is set forth, though in a slightly different form, in the kindred law of redemption, touching the firstlings of beasts, whether clean or unclean. The lamb, for example, redeems the ass. So it must be. The clean are called and content to be sacrifices. For the law of redemption, which is the law of love, is this, that they who are first redeemed and blessed, must bless others. You know, so much of church doctrine is so callous, so cold. We believe in eternal torment. The church believes in eternal torment. Unbelievable. And this is their joy, to be like Christ. That is to be channels of blessing to viler, weaker souls. So it's very offensive, for example, when I, when you see videos of people who will call certain people evil names, people who are doing evil things, but don't be like them. They are vile. We understand that they are vile, but they one day will come in too. For all higher and elder beings serve the lower and younger. The firstborn, therefore, must serve and save others. Their calling is to be, like Christ, channels of blessing and life to thousands, 
millions of later born. O glorious day when our Lord and Head shall give of his treasure to his firstborn, that they may with him redeem all lands and all brethren, when with him they shall judge their captive brethren, who through their unbelief have lost their own inheritance. Then shall the laver be multiplied into ten lavers. You had one with Moses, you had ten with Solomon. Till the water of life becomes a sea of crystal, large enough even for Babylon the Great to sink into, and to be found no more at all forever. Then shall the elect run to and fro as sparks among the stubble. And as all sparks or seeds of light, though they may come forth at long intervals from one another, are yet congenial if they have come out of a common root, as they can only not only mingle rays with rays and embrace each other, but in virtue of a common nature, have the same power of consuming and purifying that they come in contact with. So shall Christ's members judge the world with him and consume the evil with that same fire which Christ came to cast into the earth and with which he is yet pledged to baptize all nations. So you see, Andrew Jukes believed that the Kodeshim, the glorified Kodeshim, were the lake of fire who would redeem the vile. Here then is the key to one part of the apparent contradiction between mercy upon all and yet the election of a little flock, the chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Between all the kindreds of the earth blessed in Christ, remember, Abraham was to bless all, all the families of the earth, and yet there being a straight and a narrow way and few finding it. See, that's how you understand these two apparently con contradictory ideas. Only a few do find the first resurrection. The way to the first resurrection is a narrow way. Here is the answer to the question, will you show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? The firstborn and firstfruits are the few and little flock. But these, though first delivered from the curse, have a relation to the whole creation, which shall be saved in the appointed times by the firstborn seed, that is, by Christ and his body. Through those appointed baptisms, whether of fire or water, which are required to bring about the restitution of all things. Paul expressly declares this when he says, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. The church, like Christ its head, is itself a great sacrament, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given unto men, ordained by God himself as a means whereby they may receive the same, and a pledge to assure them thereof. And the blessing of the elect, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, is but the means and pledge, as the apostle says, of wider blessing, the means of which, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God designs to gather together in one all things in Christ, whether they be things which are in heaven or which are in earth, even in him. 
and the pledge that he both can and will do it, as he has already done it. And some of the weakest and the worst. For God has chosen the base things of the world, yea, the things which are not, to show to all that there are none so weak that he can save, and none so vile that he can change and cleanse them. Thus, when he comes with ten thousands of his saints, he will not only by them convince all ungodly sinners of all their hard speeches, which they have spoken against him. This is from the book of Jude. For if the thief be saved and the Mag- Magdalene changed, who shall dare to say that the lost are uncared for or beyond the reach of God's salvation? For he will by them also, as his royal priests, joint heirs with Christ, fulfill all that priestly work of judgment and purification by fire, which must be accomplished, that all may be subdued and reconciled. To say that God saves only the firstborn, which is what the church says because they're calling themselves the firstborn, To say that God saves only the firstborn would be, if it may be said, to make him worse than even Moloch, whose slaves devoted only their firstborn to the flames, founding this dreadful right upon the true tradition that the sacrifice of a firstborn should redeem the rest, a requirement tender as compared with that which some ascribe to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who, according to their view, accepts the elect or firstborn only and leaves the rest to torments endless and most agonizing. The gospel of God tells us of better things, of a sacrifice indeed, even of God's only begotten Son, who because we were dead came into our death to quicken us, who took on him the darkness and death and curse which bound and would have forever held us and broke through it in the power of his eternal life, not only reconciling us by his blood, but also showing us by his death the way out of the bondage of sin and this world. And who having thus in his own person as man broken through death, gives himself now to as many as will receive and follow him, that in and by his life they also in the same path may come forth as first fruits and firstborn from the dead with him. But scripture never says that these only shall be saved, but rather that in this seed, whose portion as a firstborn is double, all the kindreds of the earth shall be blessed. So let us continue our walk to become the firstborn, to take part in the out-resurrection, the resurrection from the dead, the first resurrection. Knowing that we too will become priests of God and perform the same role for others who are vile and wretched. This is the great calling of the Kodashim, of the overcomers of God.